I chose something different. I chose the impossible. I chose... Rapture. Bioshock is still amazing 15 years later, and it's filled with amazing ideas. We could look at whether or not survival at any cost is worthwhile, or is biology determinant of free will, or should we lower the age of consent? But rather than looking at stupid questions, I want to look at something that has been concerning me for years. Whether or not there is any juice to Andrew Ryan's objectivism. All right, all right, I, I promise I will not make any more pedophile jokes. I've done it before on this channel when it comes to libertarians, but I can write a better quality of humor here. If nothing else, the idea of libertarianism deserves fair examination without me poisoning the well. I'm a philosopher after all, and I'm going to start by looking at the setting. It's 1960. A plane crashes into the ocean. One man, Jack, survives and swims to a lighthouse. A lighthouse in the middle of the ocean where there is no land. The survivor goes in. He finds the entrance to a city. A city at the bottom of the sea. Rapture. The dream of one man, Andrew Ryan, who sought to create a libertarian utopia. Despite the magnificence of the city from the outside, all is not well in Rapture. They discovered a special substance at the bottom of the sea known as Adam which has the power, both figuratively and literally, to change humanity forever. Frank Fontaine, an entrepreneur who came looking for, um, for opportunity under the sea, understood the potential of this product. And while Andrew Ryan pursued traditional businesses and utilities like water and transport, Fontaine bought all of the atom. As the two titans of industry clashed, the city suffered. Fights broke out, people were murdered, and madmen were unleashed. The law broke down. Rapture was engulfed in an arms race for Adam. Fontaine was apparently killed, leaving Ryan to clean up the mess. But Fontaine's riot ignited a fire in the people of Rapture. Ryan's reaction to the business rival's demise was to crack down on the very freedoms he sought to protect. A revolutionary named Atlas rose up to take on the charge. The moment your character arrives, he's attacked by an Adam-addicted junkie. Society has completely broken down, and Atlas asks for your help in taking down Ryan. Would you kindly? Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find that? Would you kindly find Would you kindly get this? Would you kindly head to Ryan's office and kill the son of a bitch? Your exploration of Rapture is a confronting one. Little girls are being transformed into monsters to collect Adam and then murdered. They're protected by hulking creatures that once were human but are now husks. The big daddies. Their deaths mean nothing to hungry consumers who are so addled on the drug they would do anything for power. In the end, the city falls into dust. Ryan is killed by your hand. Not of your choice, though. Atlas was Fontaine in disguise all along and was using Adam to control you the whole time. You go on to kill Fontaine and escape the city for good. Depending on your choices, you get one of two endings. One where you harvested the little sisters for Adam to maximize your chances for survival, and the other where you spared all of them, making your life harder but giving these, chance these girls a genuine chance at life. So now I want to unpack... Andrew Ryan's ideas of libertarianism and objectivism. Libertarianism comes from an extreme left-wing philosophy. Despite it being seen as centrist or right-wing ideologically these days, it's based in the meta-ethical position of objectivism. And this means that there are absolute moral facts that exist independently of context or culture or circumstance. So if someone says that God exists and that laws come from God, that's an objectivist stance. If someone is an objectivist, they'll look at gender and then believe that is inherently a biological function rather than emerging from social or cultural context. For objectivists, reality exists independent of human experience. 
Andrew Ryan is an objectivist and he believes in what he calls the great chain of industry. He deifies this force. He believes it has powers. It has a will of its own. You could know it in how people naturally want to buy, naturally want to sell and produce. It's moving in the right direction when we act in our own self-interest and slackens when we behave irrationally or selflessly. Greed, for lack of a better word, is good. From this he derives his ethics. His morality is determined by adherence to the will of the market. To be ethical is to be rationally self-interested. In other words, if you do what rationally benefits you, you are behaving like a good person. Ryan's great chain belief is a form of laissez-faire economics. It's an ideal in which every consumer and worker influences business and entrepreneurs to create and distribute what is needed. Everyone has a natural desire to buy, to sell, to produce, to consume. Each time this happens, the great chain shifts forward and backward in response. The whole process must be unregulated in a market in order to work well. Government interventions are an immoral imposition to people's natural rights to consume and to create. This is obviously an allusion to Adam Smith's writing on the invisible hand of the market. He argued that individuals pursuing their own self-interest was for the common good. I want to quote a little bit here. It is the pursuit of the individual self-interest that enables society based on the division of labor to function. And from the wealth of nations. It is not the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own self-interest. Quoting, By directing that industry in such a manner as its produce may be of greatest value, he intends only his own gain, and he is, in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Nor is it always the worse for society that it was no part of it. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. I have never known much good done by those who affected to trade for the public good. Now what this means is that libertarians argue that people acting in their own self-interest will create a better world naturally. Government intrusion and regulation is immoral then. It is definitionally unwelcome and unnecessary as an imposition on freedom. Andrew Ryan puts it this way. Is a man not entitled to the sweat of his brow? No, says the man in Washington, it belongs to the poor. No, says the man in the Vatican, it belongs to God. No, says the man in Moscow, it belongs to everyone. In other words, capitalist democracies are immoral as they seek to solve systemic injustices. For Ryan, there's no such thing. Taking from the rich to give to the poor is not just an exercise in futility because it can't be solved. It's inherently immoral, as all people must strive to be industrious and hardworking. Religious beliefs, especially Christianity, are immoral because God doesn't exist. It's a moral fact. For Ryan, it's all a grift. At best, it's doing the same thing that democracies are doing. Helping disadvantaged people. And at worst, it's all a scam. Communism is perhaps the worst of, of all for the libertarian as they regulate the entire economy. Individuals have the right to own anything they enter into a contract to buy, which means that they can own the means of production for libertarians. For the state to own factories and utilities is the height of injustice here. For libertarians, governments should be absolutely minimized to the smallest possible level. For Andrew Ryan, that's a constabulary that investigates and punishes crimes. He also has one significant law, that there is to be no contact with the outside world. A libertarian utopia, then, is an anarchistic state with everyone being self-governing. 
Your interactions with each other are based on mutual self-interest. There's no need for trust within this system, as moral agents are all acting for their own personal benefit. You don't need to trust them because you know that they'll do what's best for them. It's all very predictable. There's no need for imperfect democracies or totalitarian dictatorships because everyone will be their own government. So where did Rapture go wrong? Why does libertarianism fail? Perhaps I should say why Rapture failed as a libertarian utopia, but so we'll get into that. But there are three reasons. First, Adam required regulation. Secondly, there was a lack of public goods. And third, it was actually a dictatorship. Let's talk about the first point. Adam was a drug that changed the human genome and allowed people to shoot lightning out of their fingers. So, yeah, that's kind of dangerous. It also caused psychosis in a major way. Mid to long term exposure made to the drug made people violently psychotic and unstable and also want to walk along the roof like human spiders. So, yeah, that's, that's not ideal. Andrew Ryan believed that this kind of outcome is something that the Great Chain would sort out in time. There's no need to regulate people because they would use their rational self-interest to simply not buy Adam anymore. This is a bullshit argument though, because one, drug addiction ran throughout the whole city, which is way too much harm to tolerate. It would take an incredible leap of logic to think that this is not a market failure. And two, rational self-interest is a nonsense idea in the first place. You know what's a good idea? Scientific testing on Adam to see how to use it safely. You know what that requires? Regulation. It literally did not happen safely without regulation. Now it might be an imposition on Fontaine Futuristics to regulate the industry, but everyone gains in liberty because they're not harmed by the negligence of a myopic business interest. As to the second point, rational self-interest is generally seen by libertarians as a kind of hedonistic utilitarianism. Every person has the moral imperative to see what is needed to improve their lives and pursue their goals. All actions you take should be well thought out and follow the same. But this is contingent on being well informed. It also requires everyone has the same conception of values for one another particularly when it comes to being business-minded. I believe that art is about self-expression and communication of the sublime, but for the objectivist, it's simply another type of business. Materialism is prioritized over everything else. No one can be well-informed about Adam. The development of the drug was hidden behind walls of industry secrecy, and Fontaine Futuristics has every reason to hide the negative side effects. No one wants to look like this. No one wants psychosis. There are perverse incentives for power in Adam, but that's irrationally self-interested. It'll do more harm over time, so it's not something anyone should rationally want. There's something that's overlooked a lot of the time, and it's the question about how you would become rationally self-interested in the first place. Option one is that everyone is naturally rational and naturally self-interested, or a centralized education system produces rationality. There's simply no other way to do it consistently. I'm a critical thinking educator. I can tell you that rationality is something that you can develop in a systematic way, but you can't become a rational thinker without knowing how to logically connect ideas. That takes training, practice, deliberate teaching. You know what that needs? A centralized education system. Not for democracy, although that is true, but depending on whether or not you're born to anti-intellectual communities or rich, educated parents, your mileage is going to vary greatly. No amount of scrappy self-reliance can create an ordered mind. In either case, we can't trust people to even know what the rational self-interest is when we don't know about literally every topic to a postgraduate level. This is why we have experts. The libertarian is ideologically opposed to regulation of any type because many of them are smart, well-educated, and thoughtful. But I'm a pragmatic philosopher, not an ideologue. I care about how much an action furthers our goals and our values, which means that a libertarian is opposed ideologically to... Regardless of rational self-interest and whether or not that's a real thing, public goods are definitely real and measurable. When humans cohabitate, we need to use the same things. Water, air, roads, public infrastructure. 
They are all needed for society to function properly. Rapture doesn't have any public goods. Air is owned and operated by Ryan Industries, water and plumbing too. Transport is all of these fancy private bathospheres. Food is a private concern, except for when you're hunting for it in garbage cans. But here's a pragmatic argument for public goods. Banning heroin is in the public interest because it is too dangerous to public health, meaning that citizens will be more productive and happier. Having schools for free is good because having educated citizens and makes them more productive and happier. Having hospitals is for the public interest because public health makes citizens more productive and happier. And protecting children from child molesters is good because they become more productive and happier. Honestly, I keep harping on on this point about children and libertarians being pedophiles a lot of the time simply because they seem to want to be libertarians in order to break laws against doing harm to children. Why else would you care so much about it? What rule do you desperately think is wrong and that you can't negotiate with in public for? I'm inevitably going to get comments about how this is a video game and that's not how it would work in real life. But did you know that libertarians have tried to set up countries before? There was the time that libertarians set up a town based on their values and they couldn't agree on the collective public good of garbage collection, and their town was destroyed by bears. Seriously, they couldn't agree on a bear patrol because they'd need to tax it, so the town was destroyed. Just to be clear, every libertarian utopia has always failed, and I'm going to prove it. Let me show you a few. Having been to the United States and spent some time in LA, I've come to understand that there are cases where the government has been deliberately hobbled and can't actually deal with problems at all. That's a tough one, and a situation I believe comes from their political culture, but democracy is designed to weed out these sorts of deliberate subversions of effective governance. In Bioshock, there is no democracy though, because... A libertarian utopia is governed by each individual. Unlike a democracy where the people are sovereign through representation, for the libertarian, it's all self-governance. Every man and woman is a king of their own domain. But that's not how it works for Rapture. Ryan owns nearly every single public utility, like the air and the water, and the rent on most apartments. More than that, Ryan deifies himself at every turn. He worships the free market, but puts statues of himself everywhere. Most of them are not even in his immediate vicinity. It's so that everyone else can learn to worship him. This is a dictatorship. This is the core contradiction of libertarianism. They have to be dictators at the core. It's not a conscious thing, and it's not a desire for conquest or power. They just be to want to be the one person with the ability to do whatever they want. Sure, anyone else can do what they want too, with the one rule that they can't affect what the dictator wants or does. The problem with this is that, really, only one person can be allowed to do whatever they want, and that's a dictatorship. Ryan holds up his objectivist ideology really clearly. A man chooses. A slave obeys. At the core of this ideology is a belief in your individual autonomy being more important than anything else. To do otherwise would be a, to be a slave. In some ways, it's reminiscent of existentialism, where Sartre argued that we have a radical freedom to do with what we will. All the barriers in our way have to do with our facticity. There are things we literally cannot change, but being a slave is not one of them. Slaves operate under bad faith. They do not see that they can rise up against their masters. They see no option but obedience. I don't find this view convincing, though. A machine obeys, but I've fought hundreds of turrets and whirly gigs at this point, and they had no more choice in obeying than I did. A slave obeys 
because of duress. Your character's programming is biological, not mechanical, but it's still programming. Andrew Ryan's philosophy points to the individual and blames them for all the problems in their life. However, there are powerful factors that are psychological, social, and moral that stand in the way of the radical freedoms that Ryan thinks we have. You know what would make me radically free? Having no friends, no family, and all the money in the world to build a city under the sea. The main character cannot choose to do differently yet. The little sisters have prevented the one tiny choice so far, and even then that choice has not been made well informed. This is all in line with Ryan's hedonistic worldview where rational self-interest is the only path to moral behavior. But what is self-interest here? The ending here depicts a social and emotional connection Potentially power as a main interest, but I know Ryan would not choose either. He doesn't want conquest. He wants to be the laissez-faire emperor of his tiny little empire at the bottom of the sea. Ryan nationalizes. That's antithetical to libertarianism. He's an autocratic dictator. He's just less malicious than most. And then he demonstrates that to have an effective running state, there needs to be a centralized control anyway. A constabulary, at a minimum, to investigate and punish crime, is not enough, even if it was a mercenary force. He's not even internally morally consistent by the end, as he regulates trade by preventing international business. As I said, Ryan owns the very air. Anything that a person produces is technically their own property, except when a contract specifies that he owns it. Power is bestowed disproportionately on the wealthy from the start because they can own the ideas and outputs of people. In theory, anyone could own their own stuff, but a precondition of this is wealth. Most of these people don't have a choice but to obey. To do otherwise is to starve and die. There's an example in-game of a character whose job is to ensure the toilets are plumbed. The guy says that he's going to do work of a high standard regardless of the pay, and as a result, he gets rewarded with the job for the entire city. It's an enormous boon. What Ryan doesn't understand is that this is actually the basis for a friendship with another person. They share common values, and this is why he's rewarded him. It's not about the money. Other people like Su Chong are just pragmatic. They want to do what gets them towards their goals. And it's a measure of Fontaine's pragmatism that he wins over the people of Rapture. It wasn't the, the great chain or the invisible hand of the market here. The other major players are feudal lords in Ryan's kingdom. Dr. Steinman gets to indulge his pursuit of aesthetic perfection, free of consequences as long as he kicks up his tribute to the king. Julie Langford is literally the creator of air down here at the bottom of the sea, and yet her disobedience to the ruler gets her a death sentence. Sander Cohen can murder as many of his ex-lovers as he likes, as long as he defers to Andrew Ryan in the end. Though Cohen's greater level of power protects him when he obe disobeys from time to time. Frank Fontaine, though, is a grifter. He uses everyone and everything in pursuit of his own goals. His appeals to justice and fairness are all false. Fontaine degenerates into a junkie rather than a dictator. He's so spliced up at the end that he's unrecognizable as a human being. Fontaine would be a worse ruler in every single way, but his lack of stability would mean that it's short-lived, despite the fact that there would both be dictatorships. <laughs> Ryan couches everything in a rhetorical question. Should a farmer not be able to sell his food? Is a potter not entitled to a profit from his pots? There's a pretty obvious implication that everyone should be able to own their own labor and achieve their own versions of success. That's not a hierarchy. That's egalitarian in its nature. That's good. No person is inherently worth more than any other. What distinguishes one person from another is their creativity, their effort, and their will to power. That sounds meritocratic to me. I kind of like parts of this idea. I like the idea that every person can become who and what they want to be to determine their own way of life. However, there's something basic that this overlooks, and this is the reason why libertarianism tends to be seen as right wing. Rapture and Ryan's vision of utopia is inegalitarian and self-defeating. 
the free market and the great chain of industry simply can't do certain things. You know what the free market doesn't care about? Equality. It also doesn't care about injustice. Let's look at how they say that it's going to produce the common good. First, rich people buy the stuff that they want. This improves everyone's lives for some reason that is unclear. And thus, everybody gets what they want. This is obviously one of the central lines of reasoning and trickle-down economics, which has been proven demonstrably false and incorrect at this point. They want it to work this way so they can continue being rich without having social conscience, but it simply never has worked. In Ryan's backstory, his family made it rich by happening across land filled with oil. So let me ask you this question. Did you earn it if you simply won the lottery? There is no doubt in my mind that hard work factors into success, but there's just no substitute for being in the right place at the right time. Libertarianism works really well if you're wealthy and smart. Free of government regulation and a massive parachute against failure, you can pursue your own way of life in a way that's direct and efficient. It's based on a version of morality that glorifies the self and says that greed is good. There's no social virtue here, no requirement of compassion or charity, just a half-assed hope that humanity will somehow benefit from your self-interest. Humans are social creatures. We like to live together. That's not true of everyone, of course. No one has to live in a city or town, but libertarians ultimately want to have all the benefits of living with people with none of the responsibilities of it. I really do admire Andrew Ryan. He is a force of will and an idealist, a believer in self-determination and self-efficacy, and he would rather die than give up on his beliefs. However, he was doomed to fail from the start. I don't doubt his intentions, I don't really agree with them, but he was sincere in trying to achieve these goals. But good nation building requires pragmatism and equality, and for the libertarian, they want to have it all without actually having to give back. In the end, Rapture had to fail because it came with an inherent contradiction. If everyone could do whatever they wanted, inevitably they would start to infringe on each other's rights. And once that happened, they would devolve into infighting and destroy themselves. The contradiction in libertarianism means that it must fail eventually. Democracies may fail, but that's a matter of whether or not we can maintain it. It's a matter of our effort and our will. And our willingness to care about each other, rather than simply rational self-interest. Thanks for listening.